It's The World This Week. The World This Week in partnership with The Daily Beast. Joining us from London, Nick Ohans, world editor of uh, The Daily Beast. Uh, how, how are things where you are? We hear there's a storm. Yeah, definitely wet and windy. I survived a direct attack by my kid's trampoline uh, earlier today, but I've lived to tell the tale, so I'm here with you. Good news, good news, that is. Uh, Pierre Aski, <coughs> uh, a foreign affairs columnist for a French flagship public radio station, uh, contending with both the same storm and a transit strike, Pierre? Absolutely. I'm staying at home because uh, no transportation in Paris and a rainy day. <laughs> All right. Well, Catherine Field uh, ventured out and has made it to our studios. We thank her. You're a correspondent for New Zealand Media and Entertainment. How are you? I'm good, thanks. It, it was very windy outside and there weren't many trains. All right. It, has it been stormy in Brussels? Uh, uh, Mark Burley, correspondent for the French news agency AFP, is with us. No, oh, yeah, it's it's uh, blowing up a wonderful bit of storm out there. It's going to be wonderful walking back home after this. OK, well, be careful, Mark. Uh, the World This Week, by the way, available for all to see and hear on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and other fine streaming services. Speaking of storms, the anniversary date of Ukraine's Maidan revolution had passed. Russia was claiming it had started its drawdown when shelling hit a nursery school near the front line in the southeastern Luhansk region of Ukraine Thursday. It was all hands on deck. Uh, that's been followed by a second day of shelling, with both sides accusing the other of provocation and the leaders of the separatist regions of Luhansk and Donetsk ordering the evacuation of civilians. С сегодняшнего дня, 18 февраля, организован массовый централизованный выезд населения в Российскую Федерацию. В первую очередь эвакуации подлежат женщины, дети и люди пожилого возраста. Uh, Catherine, Catherine Field, this is uh, uh, not the way the week was supposed to end. No, it's not the way it was meant to end. And it is slightly concerning now because moves have been going on in the area that shouldn't have been done. You know, we were all hoping that diplomacy would work out. But yes, you're quite right. This is the largest military build-up since the end of the Cold War in Europe. Uh, no one seems to be quite sure exactly what the Russian president is going to be up to next. He's got... Uh, announced more exercises over the weekend. No one seems to believe him that he is... Uh, some of the troops are pulling back. Um, certainly, you, one thing he does know is that the West is not going to go into Ukraine and fight him in Ukraine. That has possibly been the biggest indicator that he's got this week. That may not stop him from, I don't know, either some sort of military operation or continue these nasty little uh, hybrid attacks that they've been doing all week, whether it be... Uh, at a small attack on a kindergarten, these flag inches, uh, or cyber attacks. But certainly we are now into a period of time where we really don't know what Vladimir Putin's going to do, and we don't know his state of mind. This is a man who's been holed up in the Kremlin because of COVID restrictions for the last two years. And if anywhere in the world is going to make you paranoid, is going to make you worry about who's out there, who's out to get you, it's going to be inside the Kremlin corridors for two years. Yeah, hold, hold up inside the Kremlin, bar the odd uh, opening ceremony of a Beijing Winter Olympics. Uh, the flare-ups prompting accusations in diplomatic circles. The finger-pointing going all the way to New York to the United Nations Security Council. He brought on his own unconfirmed allegations that the Russia is going to attack on Ukraine. And remember that while Russia has repeatedly derided our warnings and alarms as melodrama and nonsense, they have been steadily amassing more than 150,000 troops on Ukraine's borders, as well as the capabilities to conduct a massive military assault. And meanwhile, as Catherine Field was saying, Russia's president insists he's not about to go to war, but as Vladimir Putin this Friday welcomed Alexander Lukashenko to the Kremlin, the president of neighboring Belarus, he announced he'd be personally overseeing joint maneuvers Saturday, uh, joint maneuvers taking place just north of the Ukrainian border. 
We will obviously discuss regional matters and evaluate our military cooperation, as we are in an active phase of our joint military drills. Tomorrow, we will together take part in an important event with this cooperation. I am so happy to see you. Uh, Nico Heinz, uh, between the time you woke up this morning and now, how, how has your mood changed when you look at events on the ground? Well, things seem to be heading in one direction, which is an invasion of Ukraine imminent. Of course, this all could be fakery. It could, he could be tricking us again, Putin. But uh, if, you, if you put together the clues that we've been able to gather from the satellite imagery and from the reality on the ground, it is seemingly leading inexorably towards men going in. The, I think today's evacuation of the pro-Russia rebel-held regions of Ukraine is by far the clearest indication yet. I don't think I mean, put nothing past the Kremlin, but I don't think that they would bother to evacuate thousands of people into a refugee camp, which they haven't set up yet, apparently, um, somewhere in Rostov, um, if there wasn't a very good reason for them to be getting civilians out of the way. And the most obvious reason, because Putin does really know that Ukraine isn't about to invade that region, the most obvious reason is that he thinks there's about to be a huge explosion of violence there. So has uh, Vladimir Putin talked himself into a corner, Pierre Aski, where some kind of incursion is the only option? Well, we still don't know, uh, as Catherine was saying, you know, that's the, the biggest mystery of it all. Uh, things are, are moving into one direction. Uh, indeed, the events uh, right as we are speaking in Donbass, in eastern Ukraine, are very worrying and, and bear all the indications of an imminent war. But at the same time, Putin could really be playing with our nerves, the Ukrainians' nerves uh, in the first uh, instance, but also the, the whole Western world's uh, nerves. So uh, we still don't know whether his uh, long-term objectives, his short-term objectives, is he going to just go to war to control Donbass, or is he going to go all the way to Kiev? He has. 190 southern troops, according to the Americans, uh, and that could allow him to play any scenario that he wants. So it's really a, a, um, one of the most incredible case studies uh, for wars in, in, the, in modern times. It's incredible because uh, we're coming off the tail end, Mark Burley, of a, of a summit in Brussels. And uh, when it began, we heard... Uh, the uh, EU's uh, foreign policy chief tell, uh, in fact, Pieraski's radio station, oh, we think that the escalation capped when Emmanuel Macron went to Moscow. That seems like a long time ago. Well, <clears throat> I, th I think, was, yeah, I mean, we're, we're seeing uh, certainly the, the Americans are pushing very, very much, uh, if we're to believe them, they're pushing out hard intel into briefings and uh, making it very much look like the scene is set for an imminent invasion. Uh, I think on the, the European side, because they're not always privy to the American intelligence and Amer American intelligence has been faulty in the past, it's perhaps uh, taking just a little bit of distance, wanting to just um, add just a dash of skepticism, a bit of distance, a bit of wariness in there, because, you know, the Americans have their own game to play in this conflict, as the Russians do. That said, you know, as, as has been pointed out uh, just a few seconds ago, and with all the news we're seeing, uh, we, we seem to be in this tunnel heading towards certainly something happening. You don't evacuate these rebel-held areas in the east of Ukraine without you know, a, another development happening behind that. And of course, you know, as as uh, as we've been reporting in uh, just over an hour's time, uh, President Biden will be speaking with various Western leaders, most, you know, a lot of European leaders, Macron, uh, the leaders of, uh, of Italy, the head of NATO, uh, the head of Canada as well. Uh, there's a, a video conversation happening in an hour in an hour's time after which uh, President Biden will be making uh, a public address. So we'll be learning a bit more, but certainly uh, 
the information we're getting, the leaks we're getting, and the, the actual facts on the ground we're getting seem to indicate this is a lot more serious than perhaps uh, a soundbite that happened yesterday. Nico Hines, it's got to be serious if the UK, as announced by Home Secretary Priti Patel on Thursday, is scrapping golden visas. You pay money and you get a fast track for a visa. Some 2,500 Russians have uh, taken part in this scheme. Yeah, it's been a real stain on London, in fact. Y you know, we have this government that's obsessed with immigration targets and only letting the right sorts of people in and having to have special quotas and all of this uh, nonsense that won them the Brexit referendum. And at the same time, they've been happily accepting if, you, if you're willing to bring certain huge sums of money into the country, then, oh, yeah, sure, you can have a visa, which kind of makes it sound like Cyprus or some kind of dodgy offshore money laundering um, institution, which in fact is what London has become. You know, the city is absolutely full of multi-million pound properties owned by not just Russians, but owned by mysteriously wealthy daughters of minor cabinet members from Putin's entourage or um, the nephews or friends of people who are well-placed in the Kremlin. And it's all very, very suspect. And there's no doubt that that channel of money, some of which finds its way into the coffers of the Conservative Party directly through political donations, has impacted Britain's ability and desire to challenge the Russian regime. Eventually, finally, that does seem to be changing. Uh, yeah, and uh, Pierre Aski, uh, when you live in glass houses, you shouldn't throw stones. There are oligarchs, plenty of them, who have uh, nice homes on the French Riviera. Absolutely. Uh, France is uh, not as visible as, as London uh, because it's not the capital, but there's a lot of Russian-owned uh, property in, on the Riviera, and that will come in the public debate if, if war starts. But we should not underestimate what's going on. I think it's really a defining moment for the future of the world because... We, you know, if there's a war started by Vladimir Putin in the next few hours or the next few days, uh, the consequences will be felt for <laughs> years, both militarily, economically, diplomatically, strategically. So th this is really a, a, a key moment. Are you? Is it back to the Cold War? We are already in a Cold War, and and. Uh, uh, you know, if, if uh, tomorrow there's the, this war starting in Ukraine, we're going to have a, a separated world where Putin will have no other choice than getting even closer to uh, China and Xi Jinping that he has done. Uh, and the West will have no other means to protest than impose uh, sanctions on, on Russia. That means cutting a lot of the links that have been established between uh, uh, Europe and, and Russia. So we're going to have a, a, a two-world, two-system two uh, world uh, arising. Yeah, and to talk about getting upstaged, uh, the European Union welcoming 40 African leaders, their first joint summit in Brussels for eight years, but it was all overshadowed by Ukraine and also by what proceeded in Paris, a French-led coalition announcing the relocation of anti-terror operations out of Mali. Mali, whose junta is under embargo for breaking its promises on the hand back to civilian rule and for the cozying up uh, to the Russian mercenaries of Wagner. French President Emmanuel Macron once again taking aim at the coup leaders when he made that announcement. We cannot remain involved military-wise alongside a de facto authority whose strategy or hidden objectives we do not share. This is the situation that we're facing in Mali today. The fight against terrorism cannot justify everything. A de facto authority. Is that the right language to be using? You'll be needing those Malians if you want to get your hardware and your men out. Yeah, this is a really difficult time now for Emmanuel Macron. Uh, one assumes that French forces on the ground in Mali have spent the last five to six weeks starting to pack up and starting to look at which routes uh, that they're going to use to get out of Mali. 
But let's look at that. Yeah, a strategic pullout is really difficult. And when you're driving these huge convoys with hardware, with everything you've got, and you're taking it through areas that are not that safe, you're, you are liable to have landmines, you're liable to have drive-by shootings, guys on motorbikes. This is really dangerous. So should the French president tone it down? Well, you know, I tend to think that uh, he's react. Yeah, he should turn it down. But he does tend to be reacting to remarks that are coming out of Bamako that seem to be more for internal consumption than to wind up the French president. All right, let's see if those remarks are for internal consumption. Uh, France uh, spelling out again this four to six month timeline for completing its final pullout from Mal from Mali. Not fast enough, says the junta in Bamako this Friday. The government of the Republic of Mali takes note of the unilateral decision of the 17th of February 2022 by the French authorities to withdraw military forces from Barkhan and Takuba in violation of agreements binding France and Mali involving other partners. In view of these repeated breaches of the defence agreements, the government invites the French authorities to withdraw the Bahkan and Takuba forces from the national territory without delay under the supervision of Malian authorities. Mark Burley, three times during that televised address, uh, uh, the, the, the Junta spokesman uh, calls on them to leave immediately. Then afterwards, where you are in Brussels, the French president saying, no, we're sticking to our four to six month timeline. Yeah, he, he said we're going to be leaving in orderly fashion. I mean, you know, um, first of all, President Macron is uh, sticking by the idea that this is not a failure. The mission is, hasn't been a failure. He said it was necessary and they're going to be leaving in orderly fashion. Of course, you know, he's coming into presidential election. He has to... Uh, present this in the, the best way possible and still come out looking like a, you know, a, a leader who knows how to handle his military even when they're going out the, the exit door. Um, he, you know, he said that, as, as we've seen in Afghanistan and everywhere, leaving a country is a very complicated process. There is force protection that is involved in getting people. And there are, there are other forces there. There's a UN stabilization mission there, which is you know, also protected by the French and by the, uh, the Takuba, the, the task force, the, um, which pulls in European partners as well. So you, know, it's, you can't leave immediately under any circumstances anyway, because you're just basically walking targets and it could be fairly catastrophic. Uh, quite often, we often see uh, military surges <laughs> going in to help uh, the soldiers to leave. Anyway, so this is the line that Macron is taking, that he's going to uh, do it all orderly, all step by step, and pretty much on his timeline and not to be dictated to by the junta. Yeah, and we thought, Piaski, that we'd hit a new low in the relations between uh, Paris and Bamako on Thursday. And then this announcement, get out immediately. Uh, how much further low could it go? Well, it could end up with a total breakup of relations, which uh, is not the case yet. The French ambassador was kicked out two weeks ago. Uh, now we have this uh, departure of the French troops and, and this ultimatum from uh, uh, from the rulers of, of Mali, but uh, I think there's still scope for deterioration. Uh, I think you know, the, the military rulers of Mali are going to use uh, the difficulties of, of the French uh, as a way to rally the population around their regime. Uh, don't forget that they are under sanctions from uh, the neighboring countries, uh, and, and so they really need uh, to keep uh, a, a strong support from their population. There's going to be a, a demonstration tomorrow in support of the rulers against uh, France. And I think, you know, there's going to be some discussions between France and Mali. There's no other way uh, if, if they want to get uh, the men and the vehicles and the equipment. There are some 700 uh, armored cars and, and, and tanks and, and uh, trucks in, in Mali at the moment. So you cannot get that out uh, overnight. And, and so, uh, you know, unless there is a total breakdown of relations, I think uh, some pragmatism at some stage will have to step in. Some pragmatism at some stage. Uh, the French president, as you say, uh, who's entering 
uh, a, the home stretch of the campaign, eight weeks to go till the first round. The incumbent's, by the way, taking his time before officially throwing his hat in the ring. Emmanuel Macron has until March the 4th to submit uh, endorsements for his candidacy. So he's in no hurry to declare. He's high in the polls and happily watching the infighting among his rivals. Uh, to the right, uh, there was talk that conservative candidate Valérie Pécresse might give him a run for his money when she was nominated by her party. But she's yet to secure the endorsement of uh, the biggest name of Les Républicains, former President Nicolas Sarkozy. This is images from a rally last weekend where uh, Pécresse was clearly courting the far-right vote. We will fight for secularism against those who want to impose Sharia above our laws. I reaffirm that the law of a republic is above faith and we will include in the Constitution that no one can take advantage of his origin, his religion, to exempt himself from the common law. She's gone down in the polls, by the way, since that rally, Catherine Field. Yeah, and what is really concerning when you look at it is the one who's gone up, is Eric Zemmour, who is even further to the right. So this is a real disaster for Les Republicans. I mean, the fact that they've now got two far-right candidates uh, that are polling ahead of her. What happened to her? What happened to her? Or what's happening to her, I should say. She's not... You know, she's not a good orator. She really isn't good. She's a, she looks to me like a sort of standard French uh, private school, public school product. You know, she knows how to walk, she knows how to talk, but she hasn't got that personal touch that we expect from our politicians these days. She's very wooden on stage and she doesn't quite connect with the voter. And the fact that she's seen so many votes going to the far right and she's leaping to get in on that conversation um, shows that you know, either she doesn't have what it needs as a politician to be able to play around and, and be slightly vague, but also that she thinks she's going to get votes from these far right. And I, I personally think it's very dangerous. And it's very concerning when you look at France. Um, I was at the presidential elections 2017. Emmanuel Macron got over 60% in the second round against Marine Le Pen. Now, if it was a Marine Le Pen, uh, Macron second round, he'd only get 55%. So, you know, there's a big shift to the right in the French electorate. And th there's a lot to play for because now they have seen so many populists come to power. You know, you've got Orban, you've got, to a greater or lesser degree, Trump. So you can see there is a path to power uh, and it's worth going for it. All right. You mentioned uh, a, a certain former U.S. president. Uh, Pécron, Pécresse's loss, as uh, Catherine was saying, is Éric Zemmour's gain, the far-right pundit getting several endorsements. He also got a Monday telephone call from none other than the Donald himself, the former U.S. president, Donald Trump. He told me to stay true to myself, that the media were going to label me as brutal, but that I have to stay true and that the most important thing is that I keep my honesty. And I believe he is right. Uh, he has what I believe they call a Cheshire cat grin, uh, Nico Hines, uh, uh, when uh, describing that telephone call. Your thoughts on Donald Trump and Eric Zemmour talking? Well, what a meeting of minds. I, I do think um, this is pretty big for Zemmour. If you cast your mind back to 2017, Marine Le Pen went all the way to Trump Tower in New York to try and uh, seek a handshake with the uh, global populist figure, and she was rebuffed. Uh, so Zemmour is one ahead of her there. And th there does seem to be a sort of tit-for-tat battle between the two camps now, who can edge ahead. Uh, because I guess most people think that one of the two of them will come ahead of Pécresse and, and advance to the final round. So it is really crucial. Um, and I think Donald Trump's advice that Zemmour was repeating there is very good advice if you're going to be a populist leader. And there's no point in, you know, people like Pécresse are going to be uh, dilly-dallying, tip-tap, trying to appeal to some people on one side, trying to appeal to people on the other side, probably changing their messages from rally to rally. And I, you know, that kind of thing doesn't go down well these days in an era when people seem to have acquired a taste for these 
never changing populist leaders. And if Zemmour takes that advice, never backs down, never apologizes, keeps making these strong, powerful remarks, there's a chance that it will eventually break through. And of course, we're looking at a potential presidential election in France now, which could be set against a huge land war in Europe, while inflation at home is shooting up. You know, it could be very, very rocky times. And it's those kind of rocky times when leaders that would, would otherwise be shrugged off by Main Street candidates, they could just have their moment to break through. Just have their moment. Uh, that phone call between uh, Zemmour and uh, Donald Trump, uh, not to the liking of Marine Le Pen, who this week, by the way, expelled her campaign spokesperson before he could jump ship to her rival's uh, camp. She played it down and she alluded to that uh, uh, 2017 trip to Trump Tower that Nico was talking about, uh, 2017, which she had hoped for a photo op when Trump was president elect. I wanted to meet him before he became president. It would have been more interesting than meeting him afterwards, to be honest. It's great that he talked on the phone with the former president of the United States. Good for him. I hope that Donald Trump is doing well. But the truth is that he's no longer such a big deal in the political landscape. Mark Burley, is she in trouble? Well, when you're talking about, uh, you know, a, a populist path to power and you've got at least two, maybe three candidates all squeezed onto that path, I mean, you've got to think that somewhere, you know, Macron riding high in the polls because of pretty strong economic performance in France compared to, you know, other OECD pairs, you know, she, yeah, it's it's like, I, I think, uh, you know, Macron could be perhaps... Uh, looking with a little bit of glee with this sort of like uh, shoving on the right, everybody trying to to claim the, the same sort of uh, very far right policies that we presume some of them, if they got into power, wouldn't be able to maintain. It's really odd for me, having known France for so many decades, to, to just sort of see this absence of the left. I mean, you know, Macron, who's a lot of people would regard as center right, which just pushes Everybody, including Les Républicains, which would normally be the centre-right, so far to the right. So you've got all three of them just jostling, shoving their elbows into each other's ribs. It's, uh, you know, it'll make for an entertaining uh, campaign. I can't wait until uh, President Macron declares himself. Uh, Pierre Aski, uh, it's a, yeah, in this conversation, we've so far mentioned four candidates, as Mark Burley points out. They're either from the center right, the right, or the far right. Uh, the pollsters say what? Something like a little over one quarter of the population might vote for the left? Yes, but uh, they might vote for so many candidates from the left. I mean, that's the, the main problem of the left, is that it's, it's really split uh, between egos, leaders, uh, and programs, because there are very big differences between Mélenchon's radical left or Jadot, the, the Green Party, or um, Anne Hidalgo, the, the mayor of Paris, who is uh, running very, very low in the, in the polls. Uh, but the, the, so there's no uh, chance for the left in this election. And, and really, the outcome will be, uh, be you know, the, the real race in this election is who is going to be facing Emmanuel Macron, which one of the three right-wing and far-right-wing uh, candidates? And my guess is that Macron will prefer to have the most radical of them, Éric Zemmour, because uh, Éric Zemmour is, is so brutal and so uh, radical that uh, every moderate person in the country, whether from the right or from the left, will vote for Emmanuel Macron. And that's the the gamble of the president that he will be re-elected with a, a very comfortable uh, score if he has the move in front of him with really no danger uh, of him winning this election. Uh, as Mark Burley was saying, uh, Catherine Fields, still a, a long time to go. And you heard Nico Hines mention that once Macron does declare, we'll be talking about inflation, we might be talking about war in Ukraine. We, we all thought Eric Zemmour was going to go away once that Valérie Pécresse declared. That was the that was sort of the 
what the chattering classes were claiming <laughs> hasn't happened. It hasn't happened, and I think you could almost blame that on Emmanuel Macron. 2017, he destroyed the party system. He turned it into personalities because the parties all disappeared. He moved outside of the traditional French political parties. And uh, so, yeah, it, it hopefully will get interesting once, if... Emmanuel Macron declares, uh, because, Come yeah... On, it's not if. It's not if, I know, I know. <laughs> Come on, let's play the game. Uh, but, uh, you know, yes, and you're looking at the statistics, the number of French people who just aren't interested in these elections at the moment and the abstention rate might be high. And I think that's because they are worried about issues such as purchasing power, unemployment, climate change, all these things, and they're not being discussed. We're discussing, uh, or we're hearing being discussed, these conspiracy theories that Eric Zemmour and now Valerie Pécresse are coming out with and making that the running and the conversation. And, yeah, we're going to bring on some proper debate about where this country is going. All right, so a new campaign uh, is anticipated. Uh, before we go, how fast a fortnight goes. They're already rehearsing for the closing ceremonies at the Beijing Olympics. Winter sports lovers have mostly gotten over the zero COVID policy that has kept fans away. Uh, so far, no surprise, free Xinjiang t-shirts during medal ceremonies. Instead, the controversies come from a familiar quarter. The Olympics ending in tears for the undisputed star of the Games, 15-year-old Camila Valieva, who uh, earlier in the tournament became the first female figure skater to complete a quadruple jump at the Games. The Russian competed in the women's singles despite revelations of a positive dope test. She fell but that's not all. Uh, Valieva's coach, for all to hear, scolding her when she got off the ice. Eteri Tudberitze heard saying, why did you let it go? Why did you stop fighting? The Russians uh, even called out by the president of the International Olympic Committee. When I afterwards saw how she was received by her closest entourage with uh, such a what appeared to be a, a tremendous coldness. You, 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 uh, it was chilling. Nico Hines, your reaction to Thomas Bach's words? Well, I think it's kind of sickening to hear him say that, given that he's been covering up for the disappearance of Pong Shui for so long. But um, if we leave that to one side um, and take at face value what he's saying, it is true that that video footage was really horrible. And you have to remember that this is a kid. You know, this is effectively state-sponsored child abuse. Uh, she was pumped full of all sorts of drugs, some legal, some illegal. They seem to have found a cocktail of a, at least three uh, heart medications in her system, <coughs> and she has no known heart issue. Uh, God knows what other kind of drugs are in there that were well, well enough masked not to have been picked up in the testing. Um, and not only is her body being abused in that way, she's being put through such brutal uh, uh, training methods that these um, young athletes are kind of abused and, and forced into training so hard that almost all of them uh, break down and kind of retire by the time they're still teenagers. Um, it, it's really quite awful, and I should, think should figure really skating telling should figure skating be today, should sorry. figure skating be banned? I certainly think children shouldn't be being put through these paces. So, if if figure skating can't be done by grown ups, then yes, it should be banned. I don't know why twenty year olds can't have a go at figure skating. Um, so perhaps we could we could do that. But if you if you look at what Peskov said today, you know Putin's number one spokesman in the Kremlin, it was put to him what Bark had said, and he said, everybody knows that harshness is the only way to train to be the best athletes. And unfortunately, it's going to be difficult to get around that. Uh, Mark Burley, she, uh, Valieva, has a lot of support uh, back home. Uh, your reaction to what we heard from Thomas Bach? Well, I'm, I've got to agree with the, you know, the previous speaker. I, you know, I, I'm a 15-year-old being subjected to all of this. I understand that to get to Olympic level, you have to start training young, start training intensively. But, uh, you know, I, I think it's really time to start looking at uh, raising the age where, 
you know, these athletes, these children have uh, some sort of say over their bodies, you know, some push it back till they have informed consent and that they, they you know, they're, they're part of these bigger games. The, the politics of Russia, you know, previously caught out for doping and going into these games with an apparent other doping scandal under the Olympic flag. Uh, it, you know, it, it seems to me that there are no lessons being learnt and maybe the rules need to be tightened a little bit more, at least for, uh, you know, when it comes to children, maybe just for the ice skating, uh, the figure skating one, maybe more widely. Catherine Field, of course, it's not just figure skating, no, where, you, where, figure skating. where athletes are precocious. There's many sports. There's many sports. Gymnasts. I mean, didn't we, well, some of us who are a bit older, have this conversation when we saw uh, gymnasts like uh, Nadia Comaneci? At or 14. Kom at 14. 12 years and, of age, yeah. and what we're seeing today is not new. It's just the same old sports story we've been seeing for the Olympics, which is you know, a young person caught up in this web of superpower rivalry and she's manipulated by her coach. This is just, it's, it's nasty, it's horrible. We've done nothing about it. And for Thomas Bach to say that, why did he say that? They didn't say that at the last Olympics. Was it because cameras picked it up? And was it because all of this is on social media now? This is not new. What is new is we saw it. We saw what was said to her, and it's all out there for one to see. And I think, you know, at the end of this, we're going to be very pleased that these Olympics are over. It does seem to be a, whoo, get them over and done with them, finished. And, you know, what are we going to remember from these games? We're going to remember Chinese oppression. No one was able to say anything about Tibet or human rights. And we're going to remember Russian doping. I, what sort of legacy is that for the Beijing Olympics? Of course, you're saying that from the climate-controlled environment of a Paris studio. Uh, Pierre Aski, you're a former Beijing correspondent. How will the Chinese remember these games? Well, the Chinese government has uh, staged these games as a grand uh, event uh, that proves how big and how powerful China has become. So there's a big gap between what Catherine just said, which I agree completely, which is that these games are, are all to be forgotten very quickly, uh, and the fact that in China itself, uh, it has been a big event uh, in, in the government propaganda, which is able to stage uh, uh, something quite extraordinary. Uh, uh, but all this is really the ugly faces of the Olympic system. And, and really, Thomas Bach is the incarnation of that system. And uh, I agree with Nico that the he, you know, we, it's the same Thomas Bach who has covered up the, the Peng Shui's uh, uh, scandal uh, in, in an incredible way. And he now comes on the moral side of uh, defending uh, sports. Uh, uh, so it, it, it is very, very nasty. And, and I agree with Catherine that the, the, the quickest it ends and the better it is. And at the end of the day, um, it will be forgotten and it'll be on to... To Paris, Nico Hines, the IOC will be able to ride this out. Well, no one's going to cancel the Olympics. So in that sense, yes. But there's no doubt that the reputation has been sullied once again. The, the final joint press conference between the IOC and the Beijing organizers was an absolute disgrace yesterday when the Chinese spokeswoman kept interrupting questions and saying that it was all lies about what people had uh, claimed was going on in Xinjiang province, that Taiwan was not a real country and that there was only one China. And this was all allowed to carry on at the official Olympic closing press conference. I mean, it really has got to a point now where the IOC is just really in a horrible, horrible mess. It needs a complete change. All of the IOC members need to be turfed out and replaced with sports professionals from other games and try, desperately try, to restore some sort of credibility to what should be the greatest sporting event on earth. All right, well, we'll uh, wait for Paris in two years' time. And, uh, and uh, between now and then, we'll see if Nico's uh, call for reform is heeded. Uh, Nico Hines, I want to thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, from London. I want to thank Mark Burley in Brussels. Pierre Aski, Catherine Field, thank you for being with us here in The World This Week.